it's good. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pascal Glor, and as he said, I'm going to talk about the day we've been hacked. Um, I'm uh, working for an internet service provider in Switzerland, uh, Quickline, which is the second largest cable operator. Um, and I've been working in this field for the last 20 -ish years. Uh, for the one who were at the presentation from the guy hacking the boat, uh, I, I was not born before the internet, but I was born before IPv4, so that's not bad. Um, so uh, I am used, my work is uh, mainly to uh, design uh, access networks, backbones, um, systems also, but also provisioning systems, uh, making proof of concept, and uh, working with operation for the deployment uh, of those. And also, indeed, uh, um, improving existing platforms uh, when issues, recurring issues occur. The presentation will be about some tech stuff, some legal stuff, and some humans, because at the end, we all do that just for humans, right? This is all for us. So, but this presentation will not be about that one. If you got your bullshit bingo with you. That was there. It will not be about that one. Sorry, I got the third one. It, it's, it's also on the bullshit bingo. It will not be about that one. I'm really sorry to disappoint you. But, but if you need some consulting, I'll give you 10 seconds to read it. OK, so let's get to the real agenda now. It's, it's not holding up. I'm losing my microphone. Technical issues. OK, so I'm going to tell you a story, uh, which includes an investigation. It also has lawful intercept for the people who know me. I'm a big fan, kind of, of lawful intercept. And then the lessons learned, because that's uh, mandatory when you're in trouble. You need to uh, improve yourself. So let's go to the story. So um, it always starts with tickets, right? So you get tickets. I got microphone issues, really. It's not holding up. I need, I need an engineer. <laughs> it's too narrow, I guess. Yeah, links have to be in coordinate of mode. That's just good crap. OK. Let's see. So it's like usual day, you're working, and um, well, at, at first you don't realize because these tickets, they come on the help desk, and like you get a customer, he can't send emails, and um, for some reason. And um, then uh, you get a second one, and you get a third one, and then some pattern appears, and the help desk is escalating to second level, and they're like, yeah, what's going on? Let's try to check some logs, and at the end, they don't know, so they escalate to third level. Uh, and at some point, it lands on your desk. So um, you go, and you check what's going on, and you realize that Swisscom started rejecting all your emails. So you're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> we can do that again. <laughs> so um, thanks to a closed networking community in Switzerland, you can, you can get the guy on the phone pretty quickly. So I found the guy, I called the guy, and uh, um, so that's, uh, yeah, sorry, went too fast. So I start talking with the guy at Swisscom and say, well, what's, what's going on? And say, we, we got a lot of spam from you. And say, yeah, well, spam, <laughs> that's normal. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and he was like, no, 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 it's, it's, it's really huge, and it's from a very specific IP range. And so that's it's kind of strange. Which, which IP range? Well, give me the IP range. And it's like, oh, shit. <laughs> That's, that's exactly the whole IP range of FTTH, and only FTTH. So uh, to, that you realize, uh, we do have about 90% of our customer are DOCSIS cable customer, and about 10% are FTTH. And, and the whole is about 200,000 customers. So um, I was like, yeah, um, OK, FTTH, mm, 
Thank you. We'll uh, check that. Okay, so so you start thinking, and you're like, okay, that's that's not going to be a Trojan or some virus or some whatever the customer. It can't be. It can't be the customer because otherwise it would happen on the other connections too. Uh, you get some randomness indeed, but but still, you wouldn't have like ten times more on FTTH and and almost nothing on the other side. So that didn't make sense. So it had to be the CPE. But how? So. Um, so to uh, give you an idea how this works, because I guess not everyone is in networking here, uh, this is your typical FTTH setup. So let's start with the customer LAN. You got the customer LAN, you got the typical uh, optical CP with e-router function, IPv4 NAT, IPv6 routing, maybe some firewalls, maybe some uh, access points. Uh, you got your fiber uplink. Uh, this is a fan. It, it does not make wind. Well, it does, actually. The fans do have fan. <laughs> That's a fiber access node. Uh, and they concentrate uh, all the FTTH connection. And this is simplified a layer 2 bridge. And it's brought back in a central point in the network where you do la layer 3 aggregation. So the next hop on layer 3 IP from the CP is the BRAS, and the BRAS will do the authentication. Um, they do what's called IP session, which means that if they see a DHCP packet, they will make a radius request, they will authenticate the customer, it will receive the speed profile and stuff like that, and then uh, the customer will be able to go out to the evil internet there. Okay, so that's for the topology so that you understand. So the public address, they come until here. There is no NAT up there and V6 is routed through. Uh, the device here, it's that one. So now you know, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, again. <laughs> That's the device, and that was the suspicious device. So all the customer we looked from, we, we asked Swissum to give them some logs, some IP addresses, and like you got some time sums and IPs. We also checked our mail servers, and. Um, but we didn't really find something in our side, so, so Swisscom gave us some, uh, some uh, data points, and with that we could quickly figure out that it was this one, because we had two models of CP, and it was only this one. So what do you do next? Well, you start investigating. So let's go to the investigation. So we're pretty sure it has something to do with the CP. Uh, we still don't know how or why this is happening, uh, but let's go on. So what, what are your tools? So we know it's obviously not customer originated. So we have NetFlow. Everyone knows what NetFlow is? More or less? Okay. So quickly, you just from the router, you explore, uh, export flows, which will give you a source IP uh, destination, source and destination IP, a port, uh, volume, and stuff like that. No payload. Um, we also did some direct tapping. Uh, using the local intercept features. It can be useful. Um, <laughs> so uh, to, to sniff the traffic of certain of these customers to try to find out what was wrong there. Um, and also, we have a, a, some sort of shell on the CP, um, kind of proprietary. Yeah. Um, so we got some nets that like come on there. Uh, but still. This is the issue. This was our biggest issue. This is why we haven't found anything for hours. Because it, net, uh, the net flow, the direct tapping, the net stat, it was obvious. We had it in front of our eyes, but we didn't saw it because we made assumption and ignored it. And this is really the worst, because you have to use your brain not to do that. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually not that easy. You really have to think. Uh, first thing you do, you have your TCP dump, or you, you have, you've got your pickup file, so you're trying to find out something, so you start to exclude things. First thing you see, SSH scanning. Whoop, gone. We don't need that. We know it's scanned all the time. Yeah, well, it was there. <laughs> so, um, indeed. It was SSH. 
So we finally found out by uh, looking at the net stats, uh, because the net stats, the connection were really permanent. They were not like a scanning where we'd see them coming and, and maybe a minute later going again. Uh, they were permanent, and that was pretty suspicious. So back, we know it's the CP, we know it's SSH. Did they get our password? That was pretty unlikely. I mean, it was some sort of long random string. Indeed, as every ISP, it's the same string everywhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. You forgot that one. Um, so it was still pretty unlikely. It's not impossible, but still unlikely. It had to be something else. So we tried SSH the box and time a wrong password, see what's going on. And that's what we saw. I guess some of you are getting this. I'll come to it later. So we SSH. We entered some random, well, just pressed enter, actually. And yeah, you can't log in. You still got the prompt. Yeah, now just extend a bit your commands. And you get the same. You will not get the login prompt again because you said minus n, which will avoid login to be executed. Let me show you that. That's your normal authentication. You get your client, you get the valid password, you go to the daemon, you have some, because this device is proprietary, PAM-ish stuff, whatever, which I have no clue about. We, we, have, we don't have access to that, which will say, yeah, that password's fine, and it will return to the daemon, yeah, that's the shell. Cool. Now, if you go with an invalid password, the pam thingy there said, well, no, the password's not good. So it's OK, give slash bin slash bin slash login. But it's OK. You can get in. And you just get the shell login. OK? So we tried that. And we're like, OK, we, we can sock sprock through now. That works. But we're still puzzled because after two, three minutes, the whole session timed out. And the session got kicked out because you didn't log in. And that's where the minus n command comes, where you tell the daemon, I don't need a shell. I don't want any shell. This is something you typically use when you do SOX proxies. So same happens, invalid password. You go to PAM, it says password is wrong, and I'll give you well, it's probably actually giving the login, but SSH then says, well, no, the guy doesn't want any shell, so it's fine, just stay there. So the device didn't really got hacked, but it got abused. Nobody got on the shell. Well, they got on that shell. <laughs> so fine. The cause is pretty clear. SSH was open to the world. That was not a good idea, and it was not our plan. <laughs> it was a misunderstanding of the uh, documentation of Huawei, and um, they, had, they were talking about firewalling in the CP, and if you know IP tables, what they mean by firewalling is input. But what we understood was forwarding. So we thought they were talking about firewalling the customer, not the device itself. So we disabled that because that's an option the customer can turn on and off. But the problem is that opened SSH to everyone. And uh, yeah, indeed, we made a ticket at the vendor saying, like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and what can you do? <laughs> Works as, as expected. Yeah, we didn't expect that answer, actually, so that was fun. Um, okay, so resolution, 
That was pretty easy. You just fix that setting. Uh, we implemented first in the, in the, as a workaround on the uh, aggregation of the layer 3 and uh, an access list to just filter out the incoming SSH and until we could fix the actual config of the CP uh, and then deploy it and test it. So that took, um, that took some, uh, well, the ACL that took some hours, but, but um, then the, uh, the correction in the CP settings that can take a week or, or two until you got all the testing and deployment done uh, to all the customers. So, cool. Solved, right? Well, not quite. See that coming? Yeah, I like that emoji. <laughs> so, um, yeah, for all the Swiss people, you probably know that. And uh, for the non-Swiss people, it is the uh, federal law for surveillance of post. Yeah, there's still post there and telecommunication. They, they actually do that. You know, letters, they, like, they open it? Really? But anyway, um, so one of the things we have to do, among many others, is uh, to keep six months uh, of retention for the IP timestamp to customer association. We have to be able to identify every IP address, well, the customer behind the IP address, or let's say the person who made the contract with us. Um, so, um, and that's the uh, kind of uh, interface we have. I had to kind of Black the criminals there, uh, because that's real data from today, I think. I took it this morning. Um, so this is the interface we used with the uh, Swiss government. We get the requests. They're all centralized uh, in the federal government. So if the police need some information, they will send a request to uh, an office called IPF, and they, they will then contact the ISP. And uh, what we have is an account there, and they send us an email saying we have a request, and we go on the website, we see the request, and you will see like an IP address and the timestamp. We have then to fill up the form saying who was the customer. You send, and it's gone. And it goes back then to the police, and we got money for that. Well, with a new law, like 12 francs, so forget it. It's not, not the business model. Um, <laughs> Like, you, you could make an ISP, like, attracting all criminals, yeah. <laughs> or they're called VPN providers. Um, <laughs> so, so you see, that's, that's actual real data, and you see the amount uh, we have. It's not that much. Maybe some week we might have two, three, four requests for an IP address. Um, but, but usually it's still pretty low volume for a user base of about 200,000 customers. Um, so, okay, so what happened, what it didn't tell is that happened um, begin of December 2016. So I forgot to put that somewhere. Um, so yeah, that what, that's exactly what happened. A few days later, we started to get one request after the other from the IPF. Uh, saying, yeah, who's the customer, who's the customer, who's the customer? <laughs> like, shit, <laughs> we do with that. Shall we, like, deny the request? I mean, can we? So we started to uh, talk with them, with the UP. And they said, well, you know, the law is the law. Yeah, 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 we got that. Yeah, we understand the law is the law, but the data is faulty here. Yeah, but still, that we, we can't interpret law. We were executing. Yes, yeah, okay, okay. So you're not helping us. Now we can't. You have, to, you have to respond. We tried also to contact Melanie, which is a group within the uh, uh, intelligence uh, of Switzerland, uh, and they care, they care about uh, cr um, critical and strategic infrastructure. And, um, and they said, well, well, that's surveillance law. We don't care. <laughs> Talk to Yves. Yeah, thanks. You know, governments, always very helpful. So we went back, we discussed with our colleagues, what do we do, and um, say, well, okay, we have this field uh, where we can put a comment. 
And that's what we did. We, we wrote some string, let's say, <laughs> which for normal people are called sentences. Um, <laughs> so um, explaining that the likeliness that the customer was actually the uh, criminal was extremely low because we had a security issue. This was the best we could do. So we wrote that on every request that was for FTTH for that time frame. Uh, we wrote that down in the answers in the hope that someone would read them. <laughs> we, we don't know. I mean, we really don't know because we have absolutely no feedback. We're just like a, a supplier of information in an investigation, but we're not part of the investigation indeed. So, uh, yeah. So that, that's, that's our story, and that's how the story ended. Uh, six months later, well, the six months were over, and the request stopped, indeed. Um, the canton of Zurich was a bit smarter than the other one, because they, they kind of understood the thing about the hack. So what they then tried is they made a request to the UPF about uh, historical traffic data. Seriously, that doesn't exist. We don't back up the whole traffic. <laughs> so, um, so we got that request, and, and you know, if they're just following the law, right? So they, they proxied that request to us, and we're like, guys, that doesn't exist. <laughs> we don't have historical data. Uh, on, on, on IP. You, you got it on voice. Uh, we're talking about NetFlow like so connection uh, information. In, in voice, it would be like your CDR. We got all the calls. You know who called who, but you don't have the, the, the payload. Um, so they expected us to deliver them that. So they were smart in the sense that they were willing to find out who was actually connecting to the CP with SSH. So at least they got there. That was not bad. The only canton. Um, but indeed, uh, after clearing that up, uh, the request was denied because this is not something we have to keep, and we're not keeping it at all. I mean, why would we? So, okay, um, now let's go to the lessons learned. Well, I think one of the <laughs> one of the most important is if you don't want bad weather, don't deploy in a hurry. I know in our field, at least in networking, we're always in a hurry. All the projects are always delayed, all the features are all missing, uh, everything is half finished, but you still have to deploy because of the market, whatever. So um, it doesn't cost you much to do a quick port scan. I mean, that's going to take you five minutes, really. It doesn't cost you much to do negative testing. Uh, it's very usual that people do positive testing. They test the feature, but they didn't test. Nobody tested what happens when you put the wrong SSH password. I mean, because we had a long password, a random string, we never typed it. We always copy-pasted it. So you don't even test it by doing typos. So this is really a thing uh, people have to do when deploying. I know you're all in security field and that's like mandatory, but the rest of the world doesn't work like that. <laughs> so um, it doesn't cost much to, uh, to, to do some basic testing. I mean, it doesn't need to be like a pen test or anything, but but just like verify your feature are behaving as you expect them, you expected them to uh, to behave. Well, the the second lesson learned is is a legal one, and I translated that quote into something you would understand. Um, a Simon Schlauri is an, a, 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 a lawyer here in Zurich, and he's specialized in telecommunication. 
He's a friend of me, and uh, I uh, had a long phone call with him about exactly this situation. What can we do? Can we do something not to deliver the data if we know the data is corrupt? And his answer was, here's the translation. Um, if <laughs> yeah, so now you should understand. Um, so if, if there is a slight chance that the criminal was actually the customer, you have to deliver the data. Even if it's 99.9% .9 sure it's wrong, it's not 100%. This data will never put anyone in jail. This is an investigation, you get to someone, this is not proof of anything. Thus, it's also important to understand that this is just to help an investigation go further, uh, to get to someone. This is not, will, and will never be part of a proof. Well, will never be. You never know that. Um, so, you have to deliver the request. If you're absolutely sure that the whole data is corrupt, and there is zero percent chance that this customer was actually the author, then you could, in theory, reject it. Well, in theory, yes, because you're going to end up in court. So, you need to be willing to do that including all the potential costs. Uh, maybe you can turn this into positive publicity. I don't know. Could be. But still, they're not just going to accept it. They're going to say, you have to deliver, and say, no, I'm not delivering. And then they will complain against you, and you will end up in court, definitely. So you're going to have some messy legal case here. But, but it wouldn't be the first time some ISPs have done things like that, uh, where they denied a request because they thought they were not legal or exceeding the, uh, the, uh, what, what the law defines. And they won also. So that's also possible. Yeah, and the, the third thing is, I think, uh, one of the most important. Um, inform the public, yes, but that's a good idea. But most importantly, write a letter to those who are affected. Personal letter. Tell them what this means. Tell them that they might get some involvement in an investigation. And we didn't do that. We just did nothing because we just we fixed it, right? So I think this is... I would fight now to do that. Um, I think this is really important that the person who are affected... Um, if you got like your grandmother, and then suddenly uh, some police uh, men come and take her computer because she was sending phishing attacks. I don't know, maybe she'd be happy to know that someone knows it wasn't her fault. <laughs> okay. So there we are. Uh, presentation wasn't that long. I hope you have a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> You have to. <laughs> We're in the same team. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. It was great. Um, Thank you. I had one question about the uh, lawful intercept, the direct tapping that you did during your investigation. You yep. quickly alluded to there being uh, privacy problems with that. And um, I was wondering if you could talk more about that, because it sounds like you uh, inspected traffic carefully of individual customers that you didn't have a specific permission for or anything? Yeah, the, the uh, law allows that currently. It will not at the next revision. The law actually uh, does not prohibit that currently. Um, also, I'd like to add that we didn't analyze payload. We analyzed, we, we, we were looking at the flows, trying to figure out what was the attack vector. And there might have been some customer traffic. Uh, if I remember, it was in the middle of the day. It might also have been that there was no customer traffic, uh, and the most of the traffic was actually uh, uh, criminal traffic. But we don't know for sure. But yeah, the, the tapping thing, it's always a hot topic. I completely agree, and uh, we, I think like, um, 
sane people uh, can handle that. Um, where you tap the traffic, you look at what you're searching, and when you find it, you just delete everything. Um, there is no reason to look inside. There is no reason to go further than needed. I think if you keep your sane mind, you, you can do things like that. Is that, is that okay? <laughs> but but to, just, just to complete uh, the revi revision of the telecommunication law will actually prohibit the touching the payload anymore completely. That will be black and white, pretty clear. Yeah, thanks for the talk, and yeah, it was really interesting and fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you mentioned NetFlow data. Yeah. So, didn't NetFlow help you to, to find out where these SSH uh, connections were? coming from? No, because we excluded them. Oh, so you didn't have NetFlow data for SSH? Or no, we had, no, 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 we had NetFlow data and okay. we looked at the data and then we were like, yeah, that's SSH, so we just removed that. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't. Oh, uh, okay, okay. But if you have NetFlow data and, or you don't have NetFlow data from SSH, no, we, we did, you but, did, but we had the NetFlow data. We looked at the NetFlow data, and we didn't find the pattern because we excluded SSH, uh, because it was obvious that it was not SSH, because we know scanning all the time. So, and then we didn't find, so we went to the next step, trying to tap a specific customer, uh, because on the NetFlow we had the whole thing, like all the customers, so uh, we were like, Maybe let's find a customer that's actually not generating traffic himself, and w maybe we'll see the pattern. And, uh, and that part helped, but not completely, because again, we saw SSH and we excluded it. That was the part of assumptions. You make assumptions, and that's killing you, because you're blind. But so we found that on the, on the Netstat at the end. But after you found out exactly what happened, didn't you have NetFlow data to go back and look at that? But I mean, after uh, we were not, not interested by that. Okay. Because that's not your focus point. You got an abuse case, and you want to stop it. And uh, we didn't. We don't have historical NetFlow data. Okay. That's okay. the point. Okay. Okay. For that specific thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay. I got the point where we. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could yes. have traced back the guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so but you don't have historical can you? They're always data. coming from other proxies. So. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Hey. Oh. Hello. <laughs> is, he, is he on? Yeah. You, that's kind of a very interesting application of differential privacy, actually. I mean, not, not this. You could use differential privacy to <laughs> solve problems. It's my talk. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, <laughs> so it was before that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean that. But you know, you know obviously, it will depend when the new law com comes in. So it's like if you can't even record that data, then you know there's nothing that pr differential boy can, can help you with, right? Well, so actually, you we're talking about the new law. We yeah. we we can't manipulate yeah. it. Okay. That that's clearly what the new law will say. Right. When they will vote on, so right, yeah. it's not yet written in stone. So let's wait a bit about that one. But yeah, um, yeah, but the, the, yeah, because the, yeah. you know, some larger uh -huh. companies, they're not very happy with that, <laughs> okay. because they want to do some stuff with DNS. Ah, uh -huh. <laughs> okay. This is recorded, right? <laughs> 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 but yeah, if you want to like collect data more like on a long term or a mid term, uh, differential privacy uh, could be useful. But then again, when you see a, a, a vector, you still need to find out who it was. You need the real data. I mean, it's, it's great if you want to do stats and, yeah. and cool graphs for managers, but, but if you want really to investigate, you can't like, ha hide half the data. 
it's a kind of an, an issue. So usually what happens is you don't have the data, and when you have to investigate, you just grab the data at that point. But, but you can't prohibit to look into traffic because sometimes, you know, there's problems and you have to debug them, which have nothing to do with customer traffic. But yeah, I mean, they're packets, they're there, they're going through, and you got issue with these packets, but more like with the upper layers <laughs> or the lower layers, depending on. <laughs> like you got like, you know, you got like four Ethernet headers. Because you get like MPLS encapsulation and you got like dot on queue and it can get pretty messy. So um, you will never be able to prohibit people from looking into the traffic. But indeed, we're the professionals and we're bound by secret anyway. So we wouldn't be allowed to give that to anyone or to have anyone else to look at it. Yeah. That's, that's already clear, just for your point back. Well, don't log. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't log, yeah. this is my whole point about lawful intercept. This is a huge interface. They will get hacked. So uh, how long did it take from the beginning of that, the first email at the end and what sort of like management pressure and communication was going on through the whole thing? No, we just handled everything in the engineering. Um, <laughs> We, we know how to deal with that, especially the communication part. Um, <laughs> um, it took us, uh, I think, 48 hours. So from, from the escalation, uh, which happened within like maybe an afternoon or something, um, to me calling with Swisscom, uh, it took us then 24 hours to figure out it was a SSH. And then it took us a couple of hours to find this nice shell. Uh, and then uh, we implemented the, the workaround to, uh, to just filter uh, inbound SSH, which indeed then some other customer complained because they couldn't SSH. <laughs> but, but then a week later we fixed it uh, on the, uh, um, how we, it was supposed to be implemented. Other questions? We have plenty of time. Oh, we have plenty of time. <laughs> nope. Can you say something about the bandwidth? Uh, was it IPv4, IPv6 incoming, outcoming? And uh, can you say something about attribution? Was it China, Russia? <laughs> Uh, I thought you were going to ask about blockchain. <laughs> um, V6 before, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not calling them like that anymore. It's IP and legacy IP. <laughs> I'm kind of the advocate for uh, V6 in the company. Uh, so I'm always bitching everyone who brings a new device and say, did you configure V6? No, we don't need, yes, you need to. <laughs> Did you put it in the DNS? <laughs> oh, we have to do that? <laughs> yeah, you have to. Well, is your service listening on V6? <laughs> That's the next problem. Um, and what was the other question? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, no, bandwidth. No, we didn't really notice anything on bandwidth. It, it was probably more like phishing, scams, uh, things like that. It, it wasn't really relevant in the whole uh, traffic. So uh, on, on this setup, we got about 15,000 customers. We got a 40 gig link. Uh, no, we got four times 40 gig links uh, for that. If you got a gig more, you don't see it. We don't know how many sources there were. Maybe it was just one. Uh, we don't exactly know how many devices were affected. But we expect a lot for Swisscom like blacklisting us. A few hundreds, I guess. Um, our best guess is some guy found about it and put it in some forum. But we never found any trace about that. And depending on the workload you have, you just go to the next thing. 
because you solved that one. And, and that already delayed your current project because that was not expected. So, I mean, if you have a lot of time, you could do a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, right. We could have traced back the guys. We could have maybe found a forum where the information spread. Uh, we could have a, maybe uh, informed, uh, talk with Huawei, informed other uh, customers of them. Uh, we could have done many things, yeah. But that's usually not reality, at least not in our business. <laughs> Attribution? I don't know. I think it was local. Could have been local because the targets were local. So um, I'm not sure about that, but because we, we never had any international request. All the requests we got from the police were from Switzerland. So the targets were all in Switzerland. So I don't know, maybe it could have come from uh, somewhere else and the target was Switzerland and so they preferred a Swiss proxy. Um, I'd say it was Swiss. Nice. Quality attack. <laughs> yeah, great talk. Thanks. Uh, did you have any insights on the on the mails themselves? So was it no. kind of a malware or something? Like we that? have no, no. idea, uh, because again, uh, the police doesn't talk with us. <laughs> well. Maybe it's we, we don't like to talk with them, I don't know. Um, because of the, the, all the requests are proxied of the, of the federal government, um, so we just see like uh, computer abuse. You know, like, okay, it could be anything. Um, we usually get the, the kind of crime. There is a field for that. We, we shouldn't be seeing that, but we do. So when you see like sexual whatever, you like, oh, that kind of guy. That's why I would prefer not to see it. <laughs> but, but you got like general articles in the law against like a, attacking a computer or like breaking in the computer and that's, that's the kind. So it's, it's pretty, it stays very generic and it's, it just attracts everything. Uh, you can't really complain about spam but more like phishing or scams or uh, or actual real attacks. I have no idea what was going on on there. It wasn't high volume and it wasn't DDoS. So that's, that's pretty clear that it wasn't DDoS. Um, over the SSH you can't really amplify. Uh, there is no interest in that because what would be the point to send all the traffic down there and then back up <laughs> to a single customer. If you can amplify, like if you can send a packet that is a, a hundred byte and you get a response from a thousand bytes, you get 10 times more traffic, then it becomes interesting. You can do that with DNS and things like that. Um, so you can like, you reflect, if you send a gig to a, a thousand customer uh, and you can amplify 10 times, you, you spoof the source and the, the source IP you use is a victim and the, everything, everything reflects back to the victim 10 times or 100 times bigger. So that's interesting, but in that case, uh, it's TCP, so you can't really spoof. And they, uh, well, you can spoof TCP, but you won't establish the connection. So uh, if you want to do the SSH, you will have an overlay, an over uh, a head. So you will actually have to send more traffic than what you will be able to attack. So there is no point except maybe in hiding, which maybe, yeah. Um. So you said you didn't inform any other potential customers of Huawei. Um, is there no like forum or conferences where ISPs exchange um, experiences and knowledge? Because that seems like it would be very useful in yeah, protecting uh, customers. It's called Swinog and they did the presentation already. All right. <laughs> it's called Swinog, it's Swiss Network Operator Group. We have two meetings a year at the Gorten in Bern, on top of the Gorten. It's a nice place. Uh, you're all welcome to join. Yeah, you have to. It, it's cheaper than here. <laughs> but it's only one day. <laughs> uh, you you said that uh, firewall ruling is works as designed. 
Yeah. But the port forwarding without logins, that also works as designed. No, the well, no, not the firewall. The, the SSH is works as designed. That's what Huawei said. Yeah. Okay. Why? <laughs> Property implementation, what do you want? <laughs> Close them, that's it, fixed. <laughs> no, you can't rely on, on that kind of things. You know, they're, they're, you never know how people implement, and, and I have no idea what's behind. It could be, it could be uh, you know, like OpenSSL, and they like modified some PAM behind. Um, I'm quite sure it's Linux-based. Um, we don't really have a shell. We have a, like a Huawei shell where we can see some stuff. Uh, you, you can do some PS, you see some processes, you have like some Netstat-like common, so it looks like Linux-ish with some custom shell on top of it. But why did they completely change the behavior of PAM? No clue. Other questions? You want a break, right? <laughs> So, no more questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you to the speaker.